Welcome back to This Week in Pharmacy. Can you believe it's Friday already? Weeks keep getting, keep getting uh, faster, and there's a lot going on. So we have a lot to cover today. We do have a, a scheduling change. We have a guest that was supposed to be here. He needs to reschedule. Um, he A loss of a, a personal friend, and uh, I just want to give a shout out in prayers to Joe Delaney. Um, and it'll be a, a reverse distribution discussion about strategies that go into that. Um, about uh, drug um, shortages and what the the association and network that they've built can do to help that. So it'll be quite interesting. So uh, Joe Delaney with um, First Class Returns, which today's episode will be um, still sponsored by them, but nonetheless, he'll be back um, and we'll get him rescheduled. I have uh, an announcement, excited uh, to be announcing that uh, Brady and I are headed to, uh, I'm not excited about the Las Vegas part, but I am excited about the Assembia part. Assembia is my favorite conference when it comes to business, specialty pharmacy, and technology and pharmacy. Um, Brady, I actually ordered you a hat on Amazon today, and oh, we're yeah. gonna be wearing our white hats, and I think it has like a little black uh, ribbon around it, so we'll actually look like old-fashioned press people. Heck yeah, I hear we're poolside too. Poolside, it's called the Sunset Pool Studios. It's the first time that we'll have a our studio set up poolside. Heck yeah, I'm excited. Hot off the fires from APHA right into Assembia. That's right. Um, yes, uh, if you haven't been listening, we have two episodes out right now for uh, the recap of the APHA 2023. What an amazing experience. Um, if you didn't get to attend the APHA, please look up the APHA's Locked On Pharmacy and listen to those first two episodes with um, Michael Hogue. Dr. Michael Hogue is the new CEO of the APHA. Um, Dr. Hogue has been an advocate and part of the APHA um, for years and uh, really has been a leader within our industry and within pharmacy and the American Pharmacists Association. So he's our new, he's our new CEO. So a shout out to, um, to Michael and congratulations. Um, with our entrance into specialty land um, over the next week, we are not having a This Week in Pharmacy episode next Friday because we'll be out on the road and we'll be skipping to every other Friday and we'll make sure that we announce this on social media but we'll start doing This Week in Pharmacy every other Friday because conference season is heating up and we're going to have to uh, jog back and forth a little bit and doing live shows and podcasts for our uh, pharmacists and pharmacy professionals. Uh, Friday after Friday is amazing. It's wonderful. It's fun. It's a lot of work to prepare for and we got conference season. So you'll see us at the conferences though. You'll see us at uh, Assembia. And then we do have plans to go to the NASP in September. I can't remember where else we're supposed to be going. Nan NCPA, National Community Pharmacists Association. Where do you like to go to conferences? What's your favorite conference? Uh, tweet us uh, or, or share on Instagram or even on, on LinkedIn. You'll find our conference representation at Assembia. If you are going to Assembia 2023, please find us um, at poolside at the sunset pool and we'd like to get a quote quote from you what's the evolution of specialty pharmacy look like two years five years ten years from now we want to hear from people our favorites so we're already aligning and having them scheduled but we very much like to get more of your feedback and understand um what's next because the the idea is an evolution of, of this all, of especially pharmacy in general. <clears throat> it comes from you, um, and I'm excited about uh, being there with the Assembia team. So hashtag AXS, access 23, AXS. Please participate on show um, on, um, on social media. This is um, going to be a wonderful conference, uh, April 30th. We don't get in until Monday, but April 30th through Thursday, May 4th. There is um, a ton of people coming and um, 
organizations. If you ever wanted to see the best of the best in the field of technology in, in pharmacy management, in pharmacy workflow, a shout out to uh, Keycentrics. Uh, Keycentrics will be at the show and will be involved with our uh, coverage of the Access 23 uh, Pharmacy Podcast Network summer show, which will be posted next week, uh, the week after we get back from Vegas. And also TaylorMed. Um, TaylorMed will be getting a This Week in Pharmacy episode put together so we can expand on what they're doing. But if you um, haven't heard of them, um, be on the lookout. They're going to be part of our coverage of Access 23. Hey, I also, before we get to news, I want to give a shout out to I3 Health. If you've never heard of I3 Health, that's I, the number three, health.com. They are putting together and continuingly putting together. So they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to keep going, especially with uh, their pharmacist build out. But they have a new series. Um, it's 1.25 uh, continuing education credit. It's aligning treatment goals and value-based care in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. We've done multiple myeloma before with PTCE Pharmacy Connect podcast. And now we're getting uh, more organizations bringing us podcast content. You'll hear a special episode uh, from I3 Health. A shout out to Kira on their team as well as uh, Joseph Callis. Dr. Callis is no stranger uh, to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. He's been on with us with uh, the PTCE Pharmacy Connect. Um, Dr. Joseph Callis is an uh, ambulatory and oncology clinical pharmacist, uh, pharmacy specialist at University of Colorado Health. So be on the lookout for that series. It's a great way to get your CE. I want to move to news. So um, I'm finding this from this week from Pharmacy Times. Pharmacists report high levels of burnout resulting in understaffing and alternate career paths. And this, this isn't really cutting news, although the um, article um, was wonderfully written. And I like the, the mention of Dr. Jessica Louie's program called The Burnout Doctor which isn't all, that's also not new. That's been around a while. So we've all known that the creep of, uh, of burnout was increasing. And then of course the pandemic hit, accelerated it. Yes, we're seeing it even more so, but pharmacists have been gravitating uh, towards new career roles as a natural progression of our profession and of, of your career as a pharmacist for years started to um, show its it's changing in the markets about 10 years ago. If you remember, uh, Dr. Blair Tielemeyer was the first pharmacist to build an online conference platform and training course for pharmacists to understand what the options were in your career and designing your own entrepreneurial pathway. And uh, that was way back in 2017. Uh, timing was great for her because now look at what she's built. That was a stage and a coaching platform to help other pharmacists build their careers and build what they want to do and, and do really almost anything that you can imagine that you could apply your PharmD to. And that's expanding in pharmacogenomics and, and in point of care testing and in um, uh, consultancy for specialty disease state and everything in your community becoming a, um, a floating traveling pharmacists to some of these uh, shut-ins that that are homebound and the leverage of your technology your point of um, your care testing that comes back and gives you more data as well as remote remote patient monitoring and now blood testing is coming to community pharmacies blood testing is coming to the consultant pharmacist imagine that so this article you have to read it. It's once again titled Pharmacist Report High Levels of Burnout Resulting in Understaffing and Alternate Career Paths. I want you to look up Dr. C Dr. Uh, Jessica Louie as well and her uh, burnout doctor uh, method in, in course and consultancy. But this is a great article. Definitely look it up and give us a shout out. Tell us what you are doing. If you are leaving the traditional roles of pharmacist, the the chain pharmacy, uh, the independent community pharmacy, long-term care, specialty care, 
you're starting to get into technology, you're starting to get into private consulting, we want to hear about it. We definitely want to hear about it. So interesting coming out of the marijuana moment is where I first found this article. Now it's, of course, it's spread out to other news sources, but I do want to give a shout out to Marijuana Moment, marijuanamoment.net. They just published uh, the first that I found this was on April 24th. It says top pharmacists, top pharmacist associations endorse drug decriminalization. And it mentions that the um, American Pharmacists Association, APHA, is officially backing the decriminalization of all drugs and in, and in, um, in uh, paraphernalia and earning the praise of drug reform and harm reduction advocates. So I just want to also make a point from where we just started to talk about career paths, right? There is no better, no better, no better, no better healthcare professional positioned to take advantage of what's going to be happening in cannabis and CBD and um, how uh, the substance from your study, your personal study that you understand and you're paying attention to and you do more study and you go take courses and you really become a cannabis expert. But there's going to be so much to this that we don't, we're not even utilizing right now because of the need to decriminalize um, marijuana. And of course, this is just uh, my opinion. I have I am not a pharmacist, but I know what you're capable of. And based on that, with technology coming in pharmacogenomics and understanding titration and understanding um, addiction uh, medicine and, and understanding topical pain management, there's so much that's going to come out of this. And I can't wait for pharmacists to lead. But if you're interested in this, start start doing all of your research and prep now to become a consultant in uh, cannabis medicine and cannabis consultancy. Because when this finally comes to pass, which it will in our lifetime, we'll, we'll see it, may even be in the next uh, two years. But when the United States decriminalizes, I want to see pharmacists advocating that they are really the czars of cannabis medicine. And I want to see that that brings a level of safety to the public because pharmacists understanding how uh, marijuana could interact with other things. And you know what? This is a really, really good segue into welcoming our first guest because functional medicine and holistic medicine and using nature and diet and foods as medicine is the future of pharmacists as well. And there are pharmacists out there who are embracing this. Um, and um, I'm excited to bring on Pharmacy 50. That's the 50 most influential pharmacists in our country for 2022. Um, congratulations to Maria uh, Faruqi, um, PharmD. And you are known throughout the nation. And I'm so proud to have you here. Thank you, Todd. I'm happy to be here too. And congratulations on your award. I know that was a surprise for me, but not at the same time. Yes. I'm well, happy. I think Thank you're, you. you're sticking out and people want to hear your voice and hear what you have to say with regards to functional medicine. It's kind of what my narration and beginning was, was the ability to tie into nature and tie into food and tie into fresh air and, and understanding how that ties into our bodies. And so I want, I want you to give our our listeners a, a background of yourself and and why you're so passionate about functional medicine. Sure. Um, I've been practicing for 15 years and as in a chain box pharmacy. And um, prior to that, I was a fellow of um, clinical toxicology at University of New Mexico. So I had the chance to experience ER medicine as well as retail pharmacy and taught what I experienced within myself was just frustration because in ER medicine, what I was seeing was people coming in because they weren't able to afford medications. There was non-adherence going on. There was misdiagnosis. There was um, failure to take the right dose. And, um, and of course, you cannot help these people after they leave. They are gone from your hands, right? They've left the, the hospital. And, and I felt the need to like connect with them, know them and be able to help them further. And then when I went to um, retail pharmacy, um, 
and you know, like you just said, um, pharmacists are getting burnout. For me, the burnout was not being able to show my value to my customers. That was the essential, like, I don't mind working hard, but I'm unable to share what I know with you because the faith in the conventional medical system has become so strong that anything else I say becomes, you know, not so valuable, right? And so I thought, well, I need to place, I'm not going to wait for somebody to place value on me. I know my education. I know my worth. I know what I've learned. And I have the educational skills to apply and give the message. And unfortunately, I mean, it's been, it's been better now, but previously, like I would say like 10 years ago, concierge medicine was, was, was privy or was um, tied to a particular group of people, particular demographics, those who can afford, right? And so you go to a conventional doctor and then you get 15 minutes with him and then whatever he recommends to mask an illness or symptom, that's it, you're done, right? But I, I, what I was realizing is that people are not listening, people are not that listening, people are not, do not have access to information that is, should be common, should be commonly available just like diet and lifestyle modification, right? Address the basic, what I call address the low hanging fruit. You know, you don't have to go to fancy supplements, fancy treatments, treatment options. How about we just address the basic first? And, and what I found is when I started speaking up, Todd, people were finding that information valuable. People were connecting with it, resonating it, resonating with it. And they were saying, well, how come I have never been told this? I was shocked too, and they were shocked too as well. So I realized there is a value in my voice and no matter how much I think that message is unimportant, not so important, or, oh, they should know anyway. No, I need to talk. I need to raise my voice. I need to say the obvious sometimes. And um, I think that mes message resonated well with my community, with my demographics that I was working with. And, and of course, there has to be a personal journey too as well, right? I'm a woman in my 40s. And I was realizing I was just putting on weight naturally. And I thought, well, I eat healthy, supposedly. I'm a pharmacist. I know my stuff, right? I work out what I think is a workout. And, um, but when I went to my do doctor, and she'd be like, you're fine. You're okay. Nothing's wrong with you, right? But I would tell myself, you know, no, there is something going on. You need to figure out yourself. You're a pharmacist. So I don't know what inspired me, but I just texted my doctor and I said, hey, can you send me a, a prescription for a continuous glucose monitor device, Descom? I know yeah. you had a podcast on Descom yeah. too as well. Yeah. So I got Descom. I applied it for a month. I just ate the way I ate and I followed my diet, the readings on Descom, and I realized, oh my God, my, my glucose was spiking everywhere, up and down. You know, and then I changed my diet. I lost weight without even wanting to lose weight. My lipid profile um, uh, bettered. And so much, I was more focused. I felt more energetic, and, you know, and these were the effects without even me looking for them, right? These were the side effects that I got, positive side effects without even looking for them. And that's when I realized as a pharmacist, there's so much more I still didn't know but I can still apply and share with my community, with my demographic. And, and since then, my world has been different. I feel find value in my work. I find purpose in my work. When I wake up, I know what, why I'm waking up, how I can be useful as a pharmacist, as a health coach, as a community member. So it's been a great trajectory for me. And functional medicine, you know, as you know, it determines and why illnesses happen, right? and gets to the root cause of it. So if I'm putting on weight, right, I don't want to be dismissed as, well, you're okay, you're fine, everything looks okay. No, let's just find out what's affecting you. And there's so much more that we can dig into. Yes. Yes, I um, want to share with uh, the listeners that I follow you on Instagram. That's actually how I originally discovered you. And I really couldn't agree more with a recent post that you put out there about the breakfast aspect. And mm. you recommended not only eating breakfast, but eating something that was very um, wholesome and uh, protein, um, you know, oriented, you had, you know, eggs and, and toast and some uh, avocado, for example. Mm. And what I understand now, and it seems so simple. And, and my, my sister, Teresa, 
Uh, Farrah Nolo is a registered dietitian, so she constantly is coaching all of our family about yeah. true health and nutrition and eating right and eating for yourself versus someone else and, and how your body is different than someone else. And so mm -hmm. but when I eat a quick grab and go breakfast, or it's not even breakfast, it's just something I grab versus when I eat something quality, I feel different throughout the entire rest of the day. It kind of like sets the sets my stage because usually I eat between 630 and eight o'clock somewhere in there. And um, when I eat good things, uh, fruits or eggs like you were recommending or something of protein uh, that was non non processed per se, you mm. know, not, not cereals or anything. I do eat like a yogurt and maybe a granola or something, but I feel so much better than when I eat, you know, pancakes or, you know, cereals that are, you know, sugar driven or, you mm. know, something, or, or a pop, a pop tart. <laughs> well, it's not your fault about tart because they're so easily available. Yeah. Right. The marketing is intense for these um, kind of foods. So pop tarts, waffles, I mean, there was a time I used to eat waffles, you know, put some blueberries on it, thinking I was doing a health, a good, healthy breakfast, right? And so they're easily available, they're accessible, and the busy life we lead, sometimes you just don't have time to make a healthy, protein-rich breakfast. So that's what I encourage people, you know, like perhaps get 10 minutes, get up 10 minutes earlier, perhaps do some meal planning, work with your family. If it's too cumbersome for you to do meal planning, work with your family. You know, probably you, you can get ideas from your sister, like, hey, I want to plan my breakfast for tomorrow. What are your suggestions, right? Right. And so, um, um, but we do come from um, a culture that did have a high protein breakfast. I'm sure your grandparents ate much more differently than you did. Right. Yeah. I know my grandparents had much more healthier lifestyle. You know, they didn't call it functional medicine. They didn't have fancy terms for it. They didn't say I'm eating a heavy protein rich breakfast. Right. They they ate well and they knew what they were eating and they knew what was sustainable. There was no snacking for them. Right. There was no quick accessibility to, oh, OK, I need a mid morning snack. I hate snacking. I don't recommend snacking for anyone, even for kids. But, you know, snacking for us is common. So you would think, OK, well, let me just grab a yogurt. And if I get hungry, I'll just grab something from the vending machine. It's not a big deal. It's just down, downstairs, right? That's how we are trained to think. But what if we challenge ourselves? Let's have a big meal, right? And then I wait till the next meal, yep. right? And that's going back to our roots, really. No matter which where you're from, that's going back to where our ancestral diet was. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to take us back for just a second because I have a theory I want to run past you and get your opinion on. I remember reading, and I'm not sure what the time frame was within America. I want to say it was the late 1800s where I read about the, the original community pharmacy and how the original community pharmacy in small you know, towns, they would have ingredients or they would have a lot of things in jars that were, you know, multiple ingredients and they would mix up, you know, solutions for mm -hmm. their patients. And sometimes some of these solutions had nothing to do with um, medication ingredients. It had to do with ginger root for nausea or turmeric mm -hmm. or something that they were really the town's chemist, AKA pharmacist, you know, someone who really understood substances impact on your body. That reminds me that that is the original functional medicine driven pharmacist. That was the original functional pharmacist. Absolutely. Because food was medicine and food should be medicine, right? Just because I'm a pharmacist doesn't mean I advocate medicines all the time, right? I know medicines well. I know how they work. I know when they shouldn't be used. I know when they should be used. I know the side effects. But at the same time, I know what else you can do. Just like you said, you know, the older traditional pharmacists used to have ginger tinctures, turmeric powders, you know, now we, now they, the fancy word is supplements, right? So right. we use them as like powdered turmeric and supplements, or now we even have olive oil as supplements, right? But what if we just you know, made an effort to have olive oil as a dressing. There we go, bingo. Your salad has become your medicine, right? What if you just grate some ginger on top of your salad? What if you just um, make a ginger tea, 
You know, when I say ginger tea to people, it sounds very exotic to them. It's like, no, just <laughs> just cut up ginger, just boil some water, seep it, take out the ginger and drink it. That's ginger tea, right? I think we've made it so complicated, so exotic at the same time. And the onus is on the pharmacist to teach people. And it doesn't mean just because I haven't been taught in school taught that I, I'm not going to learn about it. Our learning is lifetime. I'm a perpetual learner. That's, and I don't have answers to all the questions that people ask, but I'm willing to go and learn and find out and pass the information for you because the, the, the knowledge base is vast, right? And so, yes, food is medicine. And as soon as we understand that and um, not be encumbered by the complexity of it. So when, I, when people ask me, I said, just take, first take out processed food, right? Just go for a wholesome, natural diet as much as you can and just avoid snacking. It does make a big difference. And water, I've started drinking more water and it's, it's helped me feel better too. Absolutely. You know, um, it's quite um, fascinating to know how many people don't drink water. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wasn't, listen, when we were raised, um, we weren't, it, my, my mom and dad, they weren't diligent about telling us to consume water they no matter mm -hmm. especially in the summertime when we either had morning chores or we had little side jobs that we got to make some money for summer or we were out with our friends on our bikes there were there weren't water breaks i think we'd go hours without without drinking water and it just wasn't part of our nature whereas now i see the children you know my my children i have four daughters and there's much there's much more water oriented including in school where they take, they tell them to bring a jug so that they have water at their desk, but that's, at least it's getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when I counsel my customers and I ask them, well, how often do you drink water? They'll say not much. And, and that's usually with the older crowd. Okay. And they're the ones the most constipated. They're the ones most in need of laxatives. And it is quite heartbreaking that um, they have a simple remedy, which is just drinking water, but they're spending money on laxatives. And sometimes they're so, habitual to it. When we think of the evolution to my example that I used, mm -hmm. we had the pharmacist that would literally mix things up on the fly for the exact situation for their patient, because not only did they know their patients at that time, but they knew what they might have gone through. And then they consulted with the physician. The physician would kind of say, here's the treatment that I gave them for their broken leg. Um, what do you think? Well, the pharmacist would take over next. And back then they used um, cocaine for pain management. They used um, morphine and things like that for whatever. But it was all very much controlled. Mm -hmm. And then we got to a point where someone came out with the processing of medications where a pharmacist didn't necessarily have to mix up as many, even though we still have our compounders, obviously. But now mm -hmm. we have all this processed, you know, NDCs out there that have been over the years. It's just, it's just ballooned of how many medications now are available via prescription and that pendulum swinging of technology versus nature and holisticness. This is something that is going to, it's not an easy conversation to have, but there's a balance between all pharmaceutical and all nature where people will call you a, a quack or a crazy person mm. where too mm -hmm. you know too much but i think that the pharmacist that is very diligent and very um future future thinking a future thinking pharmacist will bring things to balance and will bring things to the middle and there with that comes pushback on the pharmaceutical industry so when does a pharmacist stand up? Because when you take your pharmaceutical, your pharmacist oath, you say, you know, you stand for the safety of your patient and do no harm. All right. So as a 305,000 pharmacist, active pharmacist in the United States, for example, when is there pushback on the FDA and pushback on the pharmaceutical manufacturers to say, hey, there needs to be more opportunity for the pharmacist to be involved in the management of an ongoing treatment because of our knowledge of going in smaller doses or, or titrating to something else or using a, for anti-inflammatory, maybe, a, you know, something that you've discovered to 
to compensate for all of the drugs that are in their systems, which I can't imagine for our kidneys and our, you know, our organs that ongoing medication forever, forever, forever is, is that good holistically for our bodies. But what, what's your thoughts around the pendulum swinging and of course, bringing it to balance? Sure. Good question. So um, when we are bleeding, right, we need a bandaid. So to stop the bleed and then we'll figure out why we're bleeding. Same thing with medicines. Sometimes we do need medicine. So like allergy season is here, right? And most people reach out for their Sudafeds and the Zyrtex. And I say, well, yes, go for it. At this moment, you do need it, but do address the underlying cause of why you are experiencing this um, his mass, like mass histamine release, right? So, but our reliance on medicine 100% should not be the case. And I think our, works, our work happens with education, educating the public, not necessarily educating the FDA because, or the pharmaceutical lobbying industry because I can't, they are driven by the, um, the dollar and they are, um, you know, they, it's a money-making industry. So um, there's not much I as a lone pharmacist or pharmacist like me can do but we can address the public, the, um, the community, where they're eager to learn and know. And, and I'll just tell them, you need this medication right now. It's okay. Go for it. But let's for long term, for next allergy season, this is what we can do X, Y, and Z to prevent um, a, a massive allergy attack. So I agree there has to be a common, common ground where we do advocate medic medicines where, where it's needed. And sometimes we do need to say, okay, at this point, um, it may be an overuse or an abuse of a medication. Well, we see patients living with, you know, with diseases that we thought were de death sentences in my lifetime. I remember mm -hmm. when, when AIDS was one of the most scariest things I can remember as a child. I think I was, mm -hmm. I don't know, seven, eight or nine when I heard about it and, and finally had somebody tell me what it was. And even they didn't give me a very good explanation back then, but it was mm -hmm. very scary. I didn't know, could I get this from toilet seats? There was so much rumor. We didn't have social media back then. I can only imagine mm -hmm. what fears would have been, you know, the fires that would have been l lit through social media. I think social media just exaggerates everything mm -hmm. um, for sensationalism, which that's another podcast that we'll have to talk about social media. But, um, I think that during that time when we started getting educated about HIV, it was a death sentence in some ways, right? And now today it's not. Today you could live with HIV and you could be, you know, you could do exactly what your physician specialist, your pharmacist is coaching you to do, and you could live, you know, a long life with that. So that that is a an absolutely to, to medication. So, but I'm I'm just I think it's probably personal to the individual pharmacist per se, where the balance is and what to do because of, have you discovered anything for your patients that have experienced something chronic where you're starting to leverage more um, holistic medicine and, and, and ingredients and in, in coaching where you've seen changes in their condition where it wasn't necessarily driven just by medicine, just by a, you know, a, a, a a, a compounded substance, <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, I would say chronic pain. Um, some, sometimes you have this obscure diagnosis. I know some people may differ with me like fibromyalgia. Okay. So, you know, they have pain in several areas of the body. And I think the doctors often commonly throw this phrase when a um, diagnosis, when they don't know how else to explain it. Oh, you have fibromyalgia. Right. And as a yoga instructor, I have worked with clients who have become better just by practicing daily movement, just by practicing daily movement. I didn't change their diet. I didn't change any like increase of water intake or you know think about pain differently. I just implemented simple movement practice on a daily basis. I've seen improvement. So and for me that was that for me that is a, such a happy story, such a success story yeah. because fibromyalgia can develop into something else and you know, over time, your perception of pain is different. And um, then you are probably taking some kind of a narcotic on a daily basis. 
Um, endometriosis, PCOS is another one that I have because it's essentially the root cause is some inflammation, some disturbed gut microbiome. I may not have been able to eradicate it, of course, but mitigate the symptoms of it and reduce and lessen the symptoms of it where the person's quality of life is way better, right? Of course, there are some conditions which you can never reverse, like diabetes mellitus, like diabetes type 2. That cannot be reversed, but we can mitigate some of the complications. Um, I have a personal story. Um, my father passed away from complications of diabetes, and I have seen the path that he took from his diagnosis all the way to to the complications that ensued after. And to me that whenever I work with a patient with diabetes, I'm always cognizant of the fact that what they can develop, the retinopathy, the neuropathy, the nephropathy, all those things that can develop, is we can tell them, we can tell them how to arrest the development or mitigate some of the side effects. So of course, yes, medicines sometimes are absolutely needed, and but they, but we can also, um, you know, arrest the development of some of the signs, signs and symptoms. So you had on your Instagram again a art or, or a link to this uh, PubMed article, which is which is titled "Is Melatonin the Next Vitamin D: A Review of Emerging Science, Clinical Usage, Safety, and Dietary Supplements." So melatonin, once again, it's to me, it's, it's it's new to me. I've only started using melatonin when I reached age 40. So I've only known about it for even 10 years. But I'm sure melatonin has been around forever, right? Mm -hmm. well, uh, that's just it. Are we, are we being taught as a society to, to immediately go to a pill, right? And instead of reaching out to our pharmacist and saying, hey, what can I do for my sleeplessness? You know, and they may say, hey, well, do you walk at night or do you, you know, wind down or do you stop connecting to mm. your phone and um, or do you try melatonin or do you try teas or like is is there, you know, is that happening before we oh no, let's go to my doctor and I'm going to say I can't sleep. Oh, let me. Let me prescribe you this medicine mm. you know, so I can get you on this medicine. Like it's, it's just a, I tell you what, there's a balance. This is the pharmacy podcast network. It's the pharmacists that are our champions. Like it's not, I'm not out here. We've, I've never been about the drug. I've been about the pharmacist the entire time because it's people, it's, it's you that's, that's really going to help change things, especially bringing functional medicine deeper into this. But Tell us about your interest in, in this article in melatonin. Well, I was um, at the redefining, um, I think, Aging Medicine Conference in Las Vegas last year. And the paper author, Deanna Minnick, uh, was there presenting it. And it was a very fascinating presentation. Um, so do you know, Todd, we endogenously make melatonin? No. I didn't know. No, no, we we endogenously make melatonin. We just have to give it time to be produced. So the fact that you mentioned a couple of those things like, you know, dimming the lights in the evening, trying um, limiting any blue light emitting devices, right? Um, all those things allow our body to make our own melatonin, right? And for us to have sufficient amount of melatonin, we also have need to have a diet, going back to our earlier conversation, sufficient in protein, right? because melatonin makes serotonin. Mm. And um, so, so it's also all a big connection, right? So there's a diversity of why we need to have dimmer lights at home. That's why the sun goes down and it becomes dark outside. And in an ancestral communities, there, there would be very little light. There would be at night when nighttime comes, everything shuts down, work shuts down. You don't work, you just hover around families. Mm. So, and I also tell people, Look at your diet, right? Is your diet rich in protein? If your diet isn't rich in protein, then don't expect to um, sleep well either because you're not making the sufficient hormones to sleep. Um, there are foods that contain melatonin. Tart cherries contains melatonin. You can buy tart cherry juice, right? You can mix it with something else if you don't like the taste of it. Kiwi contains melatonin, right? Nice. Any fruits... Any fruits that have reproductive organs in it contain melatonin. So strawberries. 
So any um, like any any fruit that you eat, like kiwi, has those seeds inside. Strawberries yeah. has the seeds on the outside. So those are melatonin rich. So having perhaps a kiwi after your dinner, you got more melatonin than you needed. And that melatonin, that natural melatonin in the fruit, works in in um, symbiotic relationship with other phytonutrients in the fruit. Right. So the amount is very tiny. Some argue the amount is really tiny. Yes, but it works in synchrony with the other phytochemicals. Right. So when people reach out for those melatonin gummies, which you are, which, you know, is in the news for apparently having too much or too little or um, I don't know if you've heard of that. Right. So yeah. we can have melatonin in our food, too. So get your diet straight. Eat more foods that are rich in melatonin. Limit the blue, blue um, light emitting devices, of course. And then if you want to reach for melatonin, if you've done all that and you have really honestly tried everything and you still want to go for melatonin, the one that, that at the moment that is highly recommended is herbal melatonin uh, called Herbatonin that is made by the author of that article. And mm -hmm. um, it's a well-researched um, product. So I use that sometimes, when I'm, especially when I'm jet lagged due to travel. And his work works really well. It's called Herbatonin. Herbatonin. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I appreciate the, the reference to this article too, because we, we really try to wrap in our references to much of what we discuss. And it, mm -hmm. it helps us to kind of like also network with each other. Um, I think that subject of sleep uh, could be an entire series, obviously, that we're going to continue to do. Um, we have a, a partner now that brings us so much resource around cannabis and CBD and how to leverage these things from a natural perspective, especially some of the topical for pain management, which I never even knew that. Uh, it was pharmacists that taught me that. It was pharmacists that I had conversations with that said, have you ever heard of a CBD you know, pain reliever or mm. something that's mixed with uh, magnesium? And I'm like, no, not at all, ever, you know, and, it, and yeah. it's, so, so I want to paint a scenario for you and this is challenging. So are you ready for the challenge? Uh, I'll try. <laughs> all right. So you work in an environment where you have to respond in a, sp a specific manner as a PharmD. You don't have the opportunity to, or at least I don't think you do. You might if it's not busy, but if there was a patient standing before you and sure enough, they had a prescription for a sleep um, medication, right? Um, the whole ethics thing comes into play where do you have 18 people standing in line waiting for their next prescription to get processed, which puts pressure on you as the pharmacist and it puts pressure on your pharmacy technicians. And I know what you go through and I know, you know, the, the process and the first check, second check, final check for safety um, you know, ma you know, making sure it's the right, then they have questions. Of course, you might have to counsel them, but at that moment, you don't have an opportunity to sit the patient down and say, Hey, at nighttime, you know, an hour before you go to sleep, I want you to dim lights in your house. I want you to maybe, you know, read a book and just, you know, relax a little bit or, and you basically start really using your knowledge as a pharmacist and understanding how what they're eating that might be natural or some chamomile tea or whatever you come up with. Mm. Right? I, don't, I don't know what it is, but or even some melatonin, for example, before executing the filling of that prescription, like you probably get fired for that. So it, it's like the challenge between the process that you're stuck in as a, as what pharmacy pharmacy has ta been taken hostage by payment methods and, and business models. But you as a pharmacist, could slow down the whole process and take time with your patient to truly kind of get into the reason that they're even needing this uh, prescription-based uh, sleep medicine. But does that frustrate you as a, as a PharmD, as a pharmacist, as a functional pharmacist? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Very frustrating. It's challenging. I don't feel like I, I'm providing any value to my job at that moment. And I feel like I'm just a, a pill pusher, you know, just dispensing. And um, I, what I would do in a situation where it depends on the specific patient, if especially if it's a first time fill, I would choose one or two things that I can share with them that would help. 
So if it's, say, um, a laxative they're taking, right, I would tell them this only works if you drink water, <laughs> which is true, which is true. Pharmacolog pharmacologically, the most laxatives only work if you have water. Otherwise, there's no water to draw for the, in the colon, so there's nothing to push out. So, so I tell them this only works with water. They'll say, they'll say oh, yeah, what? Right? Is that how it works? I'll say, yes, that's how it works, exactly. With sleep medications, I tell them, well, this, this medicine only works if you give yourself sufficient time to sleep. So don't expect to fall. As soon as you take this medication, you're going to hit your bed and fall asleep. Yep. You will have to give yourself time to wind down and relax. Yep. Right. So, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That my, my, my thing is when I'm thinking of the expansion of functional medicine and I think of, I think of one of the organizations that are in position and I, and I always try to figure out who, who would, what organization would take a stand with, and I'll read this to you, the U.S. total drug spending grew to 7.7% to $576 billion in 2021. So $580 billion over that in 2022. Actually, it was a lot more because of the, the pandemic. But let's just, let's use a, an easy number. Let's say $600 billion, right, a year in drug spending. I have $600 billion to spend. If I spent more of that on my pharmacists, instead of having 305,000 active pharmacists, I now have 610,000 active pharmacists throughout the nation. And instead of this process, 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 keep them going, you know, get them out. Here's your prescription. Get out, get out, get out. You slow them down and you really you know, you, you use your, your farm D hammer to, to go to work and to do what you're supposed to be doing as a pharmacist, you could still stay within the confines of $600 billion. You wouldn't have to spend more. You would just have to spend it differently. And instead of spending it on medications, you could spend it on pharmacists yeah. and, and training and education. And, but that's never going to happen. That's a utopia, obviously. Well, what if I say, um, what was the number you um, poised the other um, just now? Three, no, 300,000 oh. pharmacists? Yeah, there's 305,000, about right around 310, 305,000 pharmacists. Yeah. What if, we, and, uh, what, what if we empowered them with the knowledge they have and add more knowledge to the database, so to the knowledge base? So what if you empowered them? What if you told them you can do more than this? Yes. You, you are very well qualified, Todd Isaac. They are very well qualified to tell people to drink extra water, to yes. eat salad. If we can tell them to take a very complicated medicine, how to inject insulin, I'm sure we are well qualified to tell them, hey, do you want to consider a pack a punit of blueberries rather than... Your man. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever that means. I mean, bl blueberries pack a punch of antioxidants. If we just have uh, for a snack, blueberries a day, like for during your allergy season, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some difference in the way your allergies are coming out. Right. Yeah. So what if we just, I mean, we counsel people on really complicated medicines. Why can't we feel comfortable saying, Hey, please drink more water. Hey, add some more vegetables to your food, um, your diet plan. Yeah. Hey, add an extra hour of sleep. Have you tried yoga? Have you tried meditation? You just need to be a seed planter, Todd. Pharmacists just need to be a seed planter. You don't need to have, I mean, I feel very passionate about this. That's why <laughs> I sound a bit more passionate here because I feel that we just need to give them an idea. They may not implement it that week. Say, Todd, you came to me for help and I gave you a suggestion. He said, well, that's not feasible for me. I can't do it. I said, okay, fair enough. But what about a month later, you said, well, she did say that to me. Let me try. Mm -hmm. That's for me as a success. You may not have started doing what I recommended you do the very next day. I don't expect that. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I don't work on a certain recommendation immediately the next day. It takes me time because I need to contemplate on that recommendation. So perhaps, you know, I, what I gave you, the idea I gave you, perhaps worked on you a few weeks later, a few months later. So we are within our abilities and capabilities to tell our clients just do the basic, right? What if we empowered those 300,000 pharmacists? 
rather than multiplying them. Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, there's the, uh, there's what, what, what you're talking about and why we opened up today with the news and we were talking about burnout is pharmacists that put a plan together have the opportunity to build their own careers but it's it's not easy but there is the possibility that they could build their own careers as a you know we call them holistic or we call them integrative medicine or we call them mm -hmm. whatever those fancy words were but practice your farm d the way that you want to and become a consultant to your community and with the rise of home care and we can't put people in nursing homes there's just not enough nursing homes there is an opportunity right now 2023 to start positioning yourself as a pharmacist to go out in your community and literally build a bunch of patients. It could be subscription based. It could be mm -hmm. through collaborative uh, agreements through physicians. Don't tell me it's not, it's not possible. It is possible. It's just a lot of front work to get it going. Kind of like when you, you're not, no one listening is probably old enough to remember, although there's a couple, but if you've ever used a, a well that, that you had to pump, to get the water to going, sometimes you'd have to, you'd have to be pumping that well for five minutes before the water would start coming. Once the water started coming, you didn't have to pump as, as hard or as long and the water would just start pulling out. That's what the pump did manual pumping. Well, it's literally your career as a pharmacist right now, you could start your manual, manual pumping, which is things like reading, researching, aligning, possibly getting a, a, a coach, finding a, um, you know, whatever, but what are, where do, where can I share? Start? Yeah, can I share with yeah. you what resources pharmacists can tap into for yes. the further learning? Right. Okay. So there's functionalmedicineCE.com. Okay, run by um, the founder of Farm to Table, where I work. FunctionalmedicineCE.com. We have a virtual symposium um, May thirteenth on detoxification. So how we can support our natural detoxification pathways, like you know, like a liver is a detoxification organ. So how can we support liver health? So that's a great um, symposium to attend. I've attended several of the symposiums and they are a great learning tools for pharmacists from the comfort of your home or wherever you are. And also there's another organization which I highly recommend for people to join called Functional Medicine Pharmacist Alliance, so FMPHA, um, founded by Dr. Lauren Castle. Oh, yes. And yes, and another great way to get um, discounts on learning certain learning platforms and to be aware of what's available for further learning. I often get the question from um, pharmacists as well. Okay, well, I do all this learning. How do I apply? Right? Because I don't have my own practice. That didn't stop me. I don't have my own. When I started learning, I didn't have my own practice. I still don't. I work with farm to table. I still work in a um, CVS pharmacy. The way I apply is I am aware of my counseling points, okay? Besides just giving list of lit litany of like side effects, I'm aware what else to tell them. Hey, I see you're taking a statin. This is what else you can do while you're taking a statin, right? These are the supplements you need to be aware of while you're taking a statin. These are the nutrients that are depleted while you're taking a statin. And if you are starting a statin, have you done X, Y, Z? Have you looked at your refined carb intake, right? I see people in their 30s getting on statins, Todd. It used to be people in their 60s, right? People with high triglycerides coming to my pharmacy. I had a 12-year-old boy the other day with high triglycerides, and the parents are pretty educated, but they resigned to their diagnosis. It's like, well, you know, he has high triglycerides. And, okay, well, I said, well, how long does the doctor expect him to take this? I guess indefinite. There was, you know, there's no deadline. I was, I was appalled. Because, you know, then I, but I was appalled, but at the same time, I felt very empowered, very comfortable to tell them, no, this diagnosis is not for life. There are things that you can do. How much soda does he drink? How much cereal does he eat? How much processed foods do you have? And you know what the mom said? She said, oh, she never discussed these things. Mm. <laughs> it was such a simple thing, right? I felt very happy that I was placed at that moment. Okay. By the law of universe, I was placed at that moment to talk to this a mom, yep. right? I was felt happy. I felt empowered. So I don't have to be in a fancy clinic setting, being a part of 
fancy concierge setting to give this information. I can give this information as I'm walking as a pharmacist. Yep. Yep. And just in case listeners didn't hear it, it's Functional Medicine Pharmacist Alliance, the FMPHA.org. I've known Dr. Lauren Castle for a while. I finally got to meet her in person in Pittsburgh one time when she came up for a conference with uh, Dr. Christina Fontana, um, who is also um, an inspiration. She's helping other pharmacists be empowered. Uh, she does a conference. Uh, she's actually having a conference in Cincinnati, I think, this coming, I think it starts this coming Monday, actually. But I'll, we're going to Vegas. Too many conferences at too many times. Mm -hmm. I can't go to all of them. I wish I could go to all of them. I need to, I need to have more coverage of more conferences that pharmacists are at. Which one are you going to next? Well, um, I am going, well, I'm, I, virtual symposiums for me right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah makes it one nice. on May 13th with um, functional medicine CE. Oh, very good. Functional I medicine. just recently went to one, the um, anti-aging medicine conference in Las Vegas. And um, they're great networking opportunities. There's so much to learn. You know, you feel like there's so much to learn. I still don't know a lot. They they do overwhelm you, so I am a bit wary of that. So I I attend where I can. Have you ever have you ever heard of Robert Cress? Mm -hmm. So Robert Cress K R E S S is his last name. Mm -hmm. um, he's a pharmacist, and he was the very first pharmacist that I talked with that was talking about functional medicine. Uh, he's been doing this for over twenty years, so I gave him the. I, I named him the godfather of functional medicine or functional pharmacy. Okay. <laughs> so he really kind of did things back in the day where he was probably shunned. And, and now everybody, you know, is doing what he, what he was doing 20, 25 years ago, but definitely reach out to him if you didn't on LinkedIn. And, and he's just a cool guy to talk with And He's, he's partnered, um, with a, an amazing physician. Um, and, and what she does is she's a, she's a physician in functional medicine. So now they've kind of like, like they're almost like a, a Marvel team of superheroes that <laughs> they can really reach out and do, do things together for their, for their patient base. But I, I see a lot of these collaboratives happening through people like Dr. Castle and, and yourself. I think that's why you've been recognized as a influential pharmacist out there because it it's your words today and it's your message today that's going to resonate with some pharmacist that's listening right now who works at maybe a national chain or works in a hospital system that they're just not fulfilled with and they they want to take those steps so what's the first step we have to wrap it up we're actually almost ready um, to go off air but I want to quickly ask you, what's the next step that a pharmacist should be taking to get deeper into functional medicine? Change your mindset. It's a great time to be a pharmacist. It's a great time to be in the world of pharmacy. Things are changing. Just like you said, learn about cannabis, right? There's so many new fields that we can yeah. learn about. We are not confined to any one area. So just go ahead and learn and don't worry about what will you do with that learning. It will come into use eventually. I tell you what, it, it's been awesome having you here. Thank you so much for being my guest. Maybe we have to have you and a couple other functional, you know, focused pharmacists, pharmacists back all at once. Maybe we'll put a panel together. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, it was my pleasure. So we'll see you next time. Yep. Bye-bye. All right. Well, if you want to learn more, you can go to Dr. Uh, Maria Faruqi's uh, Instagram. Um, please uh, take a look at that. Let us know what you think. But um, thanks for another episode of This Week in Pharmacy. We'll see you in, in Assembia in Vegas. Look for Brady and I poolside. We'll see you guys later. Thank you. Have a great weekend.